Our Bible word is the first epistle of John, chapter 3, a portion of verse 8. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So this portion of the letter, first epistle of John, is about us and the need for us to avoid sin. But let's first look at the context of first John. First John was written because there was a crisis in the church. This community was surrounded or influenced by false teachers. And we actually find a reference to, to them in chapter 2 verses 19. The author writes, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of, of us. So there was this group who has left this community. And scholars refer to it as the Joannine community. And the Joannine community refers to those writings, the Gospel of John, the three epistles of John, and also the book of Revelation. And they were in Asia Minor, in Ephesus, based on early church tradition. So this Christian community in Ephesus, there were these heretics that left them. But they still had contact with their community because they influenced them, or, or the Corrigans there that gathered. So what did they teach? Well, they denied that Jesus has come in the flesh, for example, and they also denied that Jesus is this Christ is the Son of God. If we go to various passages, like if we go to chapter 2, verses 22, it speaks of those who have left. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, in other words, the Messiah? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Also, if we go to chapter 4, verses 2, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. What we probably encounter here with these heretics is an incipient form of Gnosticism. And they were influenced by something that's known as Docetism. And Docetism is derived from the Greek word Tokeo, which means to see. And there were two main versions of Docetism that existed at this time. In the one version, it's the belief that Christ was so divine that he could not have been human. And he could not have taken on physical matter, material form. In other words, he also could not suffer. Jesus only appeared to be a flesh and blood human being. So his body was a phantasm. Because Gnosticism taught that matter is evil. Matter is something that we must escape from. And there was this other lesser divine being, a demiurge, some lesser god, who actually created the physical world. And that is what Gnosticism also, full-blown Gnosticism taught in the second century. There was this one guy, Marcion, he actually taught that the God of the Old Testament is evil. He is our enemy because he created physical matter and we must escape physical matter. So that was one form of docetism. Jesus, he could not have been human because, or take on matter, material form, flesh, because matter is evil and the true God cannot take on this evil form. The second form of Docetism is that there was the human Jesus made of matter, but that the divine Christ was a separate entity. And this entity entered Jesus' baptism, the human Jesus at his baptism in the form of a dove. And he empowered him to do miracles or whatever. And then just before the human Jesus died, this Christ left the human Jesus. So it was not really the Christ, this divine Christ who suffered and died on the cross. 
And now, of course, the author here, he writes, this is nonsense. Jesus, has, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. If you go there to chapter 5, verse 6, he writes there, he did not just come with water, but with water and blood. Also in the beginning, is the author writes there, that which was from the beginning, what we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled or touched. In other words, the author emphasizes that Jesus Christ, he was human. He has come in the flesh. This, these teachings of these false prophets, he also calls them, these antichrists. Beware of this, because this is not the truth. Who these false teachers were, we do not know. But they claim to be more wise or have deeper insight, etc. And that they were inspired by the Spirit. For example, if you go read there, chapter 4, verses 1. And, of course, the, the author counters this. So, who is this author who wrote this epistle? Of course, most would say this was the Apostle John. But scholars and theologians don't agree with that. And they associate this epistle with a figure called John the Elder, who was mentioned by many of the apostolic and church fathers of the time. And this John the Elder, he was a main figure in Asia Minor towards the end of the first century. And scholars say he is also responsible for all the epistles of John and also the Gospel of John. And he was like a spiritual teacher and all school, the Johannine school or the Johannine community was formed around him. So he was a principal figure in Ephesus, yeah, towards the 90s AD. And this was also the time when this epistle was written. So after that understanding of the context, let's look at various portions. First, from chapter 2, verses 28 to 3, verse 3, there the writer gives positive encouragement. In view of the return of Jesus, that Christians must live holy lives. Because Christ is coming, like he says there, we are children of God, it's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we will be like him, for we will see him as he is, etc. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. So in light of this hope, this expectation that Jesus will come, live holy lives. And then, the next section, that's from chapter 3, verse 4 to 10. Now there's the negative side, what we must avoid, what we must not do. And so it's to deal with sin, because sin is a serious issue. And the world is divided between the children of God and the children of the devil. And then the next section, it turns again to the positive side, what we must do. And that is we must love our brethren our brother and sister. And that's from verses 11 to 18, where brotherly love is the identifying norm of children of God. So let's focus on our immediate textual unit, and that is the sinlessness of God's children. And that's from verses 4 to 10. So the author also writes very simple language. It's also very similar language you find in the Gospel of John. And he begins this, this section this way. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. So a very crucial element of Christian teaching is Jesus was sinless. He, was, he had our human nature, he was flesh and blood just like us, but he was sinless. But also he came to take away our sins. And in other words, he was a sacrifice of atonement. He, by the shedding of his blood, our sins could be forgiven. And that's how atonement was also brought using animals in the Old Covenant. But now Jesus is his final sacrifice of atonement. And we can read about sacrifices of atonement in Deuteronomy 5 to 6, Numbers 5 and other places. So he came to take away our sin. He was a sacrifice of atonement whereby our sins could be forgiven. 
And now, verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. So, very strong language for the author. Sin is a serious matter. Those who sin do not know Jesus. They have not seen Jesus. Of course, there's a strong language here, but in other places, he also acknowledges we do sin and we do need forgiveness. So, there's the possibility of sin that he mentions, but also gives exhortations not to sin. But it's almost for the author, no, it's black or white. There's no gray areas. Sin is serious. We must get, a, get rid of it. Those who sin have, do not know Jesus and neither have seen him. Strong language he uses here. He carries on. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Just he. In other words, Jesus is righteous. Now we come to our Bible text. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So, sin comes from the devil, and the devil himself has always been a sinner from the beginning. And that's the reason Jesus came, to destroy the works of the devil. This is one of the main themes of the New Testament. Jesus came, he conquered death. He conquered sin. He was victorious over sin and death, etc. His victory can also become our victory. So that's why Jesus came, to destroy the works of the devil. In other words, destroy sin, to destroy death. And as a result, we can have life. We can need sinless lives, lives of righteousness. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him and cannot sin. So that was those born of God, those who are God's children. They cannot sin because God has planted seeds in us, seeds of life, seeds of righteousness. And now the author also explains the two categories. Who are the sons of God? Who are the sons of the devil? In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So for the author, in this section where he gives us exhortation not to sin, there's the children of God and the children of the devil. The children of God abide in Jesus. They do not sin. They practice righteousness. They are born of God. In other words, they are God's children. And there's godly seed that produces life in them. And they love. They love their brethren. They love their neighbor. The children of the devil, on the other hand, they commit sin. They have not known or seen Jesus. They do not practice righteousness and they do not love. So this is the negative aspect our author is writing about here. Do not sin. Stay away from sin. Those who sin is from the devil because he's the sinner from the beginning. And if you are born of God and if you know Jesus, you cannot sin. For him it's a very black and white issue. But he also recognizes that we do sin and we do need forgiveness at the same time. Of course, in this exhortation not to sin is sandwiched in between positive exhortations. Lead holy lives in view of the coming of Jesus. And also, after our immediate pericope, yeah, it encourages them, love the brothers, love the brethren, because these are characteristics of God's people.